Welcome, everyone. I'm Ed Remus, social sciences librarian at Northeastern Illinois University. On behalf of the NEIU Libraries and the NEIU History Department, I'd like to welcome our speakers and our audience to this discussion. This is the first event in a new and ongoing panel discussion series titled Perspectives on the Constitution. Events in this series will feature scholars with diverse viewpoints on controversial issues related to the US Constitution. Our second event is being held on Tuesday of next week at 1 o'clock p.m. Central Time. It will feature progressive, liberal, and conservative political scientists addressing the topic of the US Congress and the separation of powers. Further information about that event will be posted shortly in the Q&A. We depend on your feedback to support events such as these. At the close of this event, you'll be sent to an online survey and we hope you will fill it out. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Joshua Salzman. Joshua Salzman is an associate professor of US history at Northeastern Illinois University. His teaching and research focus on the interplay of politics, capitalism, crime, and environmental issues in cities. He's the author of the book, Liquid Capital, Making the Chicago Waterfront, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2018. Salzman is now working on a new book about the politics of gun control in the cities of Chicago and Washington, DC since the 1960s. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Ed, and uh, welcome to our panelists and audience. It's great to have all of you here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a couple of uh, introductory remarks that uh, I hope will frame our discussion and then I'll introduce our panelists uh, and we'll hear their opening statements in turn. Um, I'd like to begin by noting that uh, the panelists and audience gathered this afternoon are from all over the nation, but this event is hosted by a university in Chicago, which is, I think, a fitting place to start a discussion about race and guns. Chicago, with its stringent firearm laws and its terrible violence, has often been a flashpoint in the national debate over gun control. In 2010, for instance, a Chicago handgun ban became the subject of a landmark case in the Supreme Court. In that case, an African-American man named Otis McDonald challenged the constitutionality of Chicago's 1982 handgun ban. Born in 1933 to Louisiana sharecroppers, McDonald had migrated to Chicago at 17, found work, and eventually bought a house in Morgan Park. His neighborhood fell into decline as Chicago bled industrial jobs and crime rates spiked in the 1980s and 1990s. McDonald's home was broken into three times. He considered a handgun his best protection, but they were banned in the city. McDonald's attorneys made two arguments. First, that the Second Amendment established an individual right to bear arms for self-protection. And second, that his constitutional right could not be granted to some US citizens and denied to others on the basis of where they lived. The court's majority agreed and it struck down Chicago's handgun ban. For McDonald, the victory was about more than just gun rights. He regarded it as a milestone in a long struggle for African-Americans to gain the full, civil, the full rights afforded to all citizens. McDonald reflected, quote, there was a wrong done a long time ago that dates back to slavery time. I could feel the spirit of those people running through me as I sat in the Supreme Court. The story of Otis McDonald points to three key questions about race and the Second Amendment that our panelists will engage today. The first is, who has the right to bear arms? The Second Amendment says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Otis McDonald and his lawyers pointed to a recent precedent to claim the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to bear arms. Two years before the McDonald ruling, the Supreme Court had struck down a Washington DC handgun ban in a case called DC versus Heller on the basis that the ban violated individuals' right to bear arms. But the Heller decision was and remains deeply controversial. Many constitutional scholars argue that the Second Amendment does not grant an individual right to bear arms but instead protects a collective right of states to create well-regulated militias of citizen soldiers. 
In this reading of the amendment, there's nothing to stop cities and states from regulating individual access to firearms. A second debate the McDonald case points to centers on the question of who the framers of the Constitution intended for Americans to bear arms against. For Otis McDonald, the answer was the people who threatened his home. There are, of course, many other possible answers. Some scholars argue the Second Amendment is a bulwark of liberty and limited government. Rooted in English law, they hold that the right to bear arms is tied to a civic obligation to maintain internal order, defend the nation, and to fight tyranny. Another view is the Second Amendment was intended to provide for armed militias to wage warfare against Native Americans and put down slave rebellions. Indeed, the United States is a nature, nation of settler colonists, and nearly half of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, including the main author of the Bill of Rights, possess slaves. A third question the McDonald case raises is that of who gun controls benefit and who they harm. Otis McDonald believed that gun control harmed citizens in high crime areas by impeding their self-defense. Many scholars, however, show correlations between high rates of gun ownership and deadly violence, and even that gun owners are more likely to hurt themselves than assailants. If eliminating guns does reduce violence, as many scholars argue, that would be especially beneficial to African Americans in cities like Chicago. African Americans make up 25% of the population of Cook County, Illinois. Of the 875 deaths from gun violence in the county in 2020, African Americans comprised 78%. Other scholars, however, suggest that some gun control laws might harm African Americans. They point to a history of laws in the post-Civil War South that denied men and women freed from slavery the right to carry firearms at a time when they were terrorized by the KKK. More recently, scholars have shown patterns of racism and gun control law enforcement. A 2021 study conducted by Loyola University in Chicago, for instance, found that, an Illinois, court, found that Illinois courts are for, far more likely to send black men from Chicago to prison for illegal possession of firearms than they are whites from other regions of the state, even in cases where those black men have no record of criminal violence. Now today we will hear from four leading scholars about where they stand on these big questions Otis McDonald pointed to. Who has the right to bear arms? Who did the founders intend citizens to bear arms against? And who gun controls help and who they harm? Our panelists will first articulate their views in an opening statement and then clarify their points of agreement or disagreement with each other in a rebuttal round. After that, you will have a chance to ask them questions. I will now introduce uh, the speakers uh, and we will, hear from, uh, we will hear their opening statements. Now, the first speaker that we're going to hear from is Joyce Lee Malcolm. Unfortunately, Joyce Lee Malcolm contacted us uh, rather recently and uh, noted that she had a serious conflict and could not attend this afternoon. Uh, but in lieu of her attendance, she was able to record a statement from us that we're going to play for you uh, after I introduce her. So Joyce Lee Malcolm is the Patrick Henry Professor, now Emerita, of Constitutional Law and the Second Amendment at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. She's the author of eight books, including To Keep and Bear Arms, The Origins of an Anglo-American Right. Malcolm joined the Cato Institute in writing an amicus brief for the Supreme Court in the 20, 2008 DC versus Heller case in which she urged the court to protect an individual right to bear arms. Malcolm's scholarship was in turn cited several times by the court in that landmark ruling. In her recorded statement, Malcolm will argue that the second amendment protected an individual right to arms and was not racist in its origins, but instead was rooted in an English tradition of maintaining a civilian army and fighting tyranny. So can we now hear from Joyce Lee Malcolm? Uh, 
Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be able to be here and discuss this important issue of race on the Second Amendment. Um, to begin with, I'd like to make just two key points. One is that the amendment is uh, and it always has been an individual right of the people for self-defense, personal self-defense or defending one's home and family. Um, and the other is that it is not racist. It is an, an inalienable right, although it took some time, like many of our rights, to actually become fully realized. And at this point, some of the strict gun control states that um, only allow people to carry a weapon if they can show that they have some need for it on that day are, to my mind, um, a kind of disparate impact which are keeping people from being able to exercise what is their constitutional right. Um, I'd like to start with a brief background uh, and um, then uh, get into more detail. First of all, this was not a right invented by the Americans. It was an English right. It was one of the rights of Englishmen that they brought with them. Uh, the English right, which was part of the English Bill of Rights was passed in 1689, 100 years before our Bill of Rights. And it was more qualified. It said that the, um, that the subjects which are Protestant may have arms for their defense suitable to their condition and as allowed by law. And uh, Catholics were not allowed or did not have the right to be armed because after the Reformation, the Pope had called on Catholics to overthrow the Protestant monarchy. So they were always under a kind of cloud of suspicion, even though they were usually allowed to have arms for their own personal defense. But by the time of the um, drafting of the American Bill of Rights and the American Revolution, the qualifications on the English right had vanished and every Englishman had a right uh, to carry arms. And um, there's a particularly interesting English case called Rex v. Dewhurst, uh, where the judge actually asks, are arms suitable to the condition of people in the ordinary class of life? And are they allowed by law? And then he says, a man has a clear right to arms to protect himself in his house. A man has a clear right to protect himself when he is going singly or in a small party upon the road where he is traveling or going for the ordinary purposes of business. So this was an individual right. It was not invented here. It was something that was very much prized and important here because of the dangers of living in a, um, a still very uh, wild country. Um, the, uh, it took some time, obviously, uh, for this to be realized down here. Um, in the North, uh, at the time of the American Revolution, uh, there, were some, there were slaves, um, but not a lot. But they were allowed to be armed. And in fact, Washington's Continental Army had something like, you know, 20 percent of its uh, soldiers were African-American, either free or slave. The, free, the slaves could serve for three years and earn their freedom. And they served side by side in a very integrated army. Um, in the South, of course, there were restrictions on slaves being armed. But, but uh, even uh, people who were enslaved and lived on the frontiers were allowed to have arms in their homes to protect themselves from the, the dangers uh, of the frontier. Um, when Madison crafted the, uh, the, his list of rights, he said that he was only putting in rights that were guards for private rights. It wasn't something he was inventing. Yeah. And also rights that were unexceptionable so that there would not be a lot of debate about them. And he put in the, this uh, right of the, the people to keep and bear arms uh, and that it would not be infringed. The militia clause is in there because without the people being able to be armed, you really couldn't have a citizen militia but it was only one reason. It was not the main reason for uh, the right to be armed. And in fact, um, in the 1960s, there was a whole lot of discussion and Professor Rakoff will add to that, um, that the, this was only a collective right for members of the militia. And in fact, when the Senate was debating the language of the, um, the Second Amendment, someone suggested that that they add after the right of the people to keep and bear arms, the phrase for the common defense. And that was rejected. So they did not want it just for the common defense. It was meant to be an individual right. Um, clearly there were a lot of 
problems in the South with the uh, slaves and uh, being able to be armed. And um, we had the Civil War, uh, which did away with slavery. And then after that, one of the um, Reconstruction Amendments, the 14th Amendment, was made to ensure that the states had to give to citizens their rights. And one of the ones that was most pressing and in that discussion reiterated a lot was the right of individuals to be able to keep and carry weapons. In the early 20th century, there were still restrictions on individuals and including in the North, um, in New York State, uh, they passed the Sullivan Act. And the Sullivan Act, and I think it was around the 1920s was passed be, not because of race, but because of ethnic background. There was a lot of worry about all these immigrants coming in from Italy and Eastern Europe. And, um, and so the, um, the authorities wanted to be able to control who could have weapons and the people they were suspicious of uh, could not. Um, in the 1960s, of course, we have the civil rights movement, um, which um, helped to ensure that, that uh, African-Americans would get all of their rights. Uh, the, um, I should say that that also is when we get more and more of this collective rights argument that there is no individual right. It's just a right for the militia to be armed. Um, and the Supreme Court actually dealt with that issue in two landmark cases. In 2008, the case of District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, which overturned Washington DC's ban on, on residents being able to carry, have a weapon in their own homes for their self-defense. And the uh, members of the court looked very carefully at the original intent and the history and the pre-existence of this right and concluded that it was a right for individuals to keep and bear those arms in common use for self-defense and other lawful purposes. And that the core of the right was self-defense, personal self-defense. Two years later, the, uh, there was a case uh, overturning Chicago's ban on residents having weapons, which was virtually exactly the same as the Washington ban. In fact, some of my students men mentioned that it was, the language was the same and some of it really didn't quite relate to Chicago. <laughs> but at any rate, um, they found, they incorporated the right uh, the, of the Second Amendment, the right of self-defense uh, against the states, uh, making sure that there, no state could violate the Second Amendment, uh, claiming that this was finding it a fundamental principle of American liberty. This was a basic right of Americans and it didn't just pertain to Washington DC or places that felt that they wanted it, but was to be honored throughout the country. Uh, my final point is that it strikes me that there's a sort of disparate impact now about the way that this right is being applied. There are seven states, including New York State, which is now arguing or has argued a case before the Supreme Court, which is pending. Um, these states, these seven states have what a regime that's called shall issue. There are only seven of them. And if you want to be able to carry a gun outside for your own defense, you have to persuade a, a sheriff in some cases or a policeman that you have or need to carry that because you are under a particular danger at that particular time. So living in a, in a dangerous neighborhood doesn't do it. Working late and coming home in the dark doesn't do it. They have to be persuaded that you have a need to carry, a personal need. And, um, and obviously the result is that very few people are allowed to carry a gun for their self-defense. Um, and New York is, is one of these that has, has done that. Um, it's when you have to persuade the authorities that you have a right uh, to carry, uh, that's no right at all. And so as far as I'm concerned, disparate impact really is something that seems to be neutral, but really impacts particularly minorities and certain groups and people who live in dangerous areas are right now in these seven states in danger because they can't protect themselves. And I, I'd like to conclude, I have a minute. Um, this is a, a comment from um, Justice Thomas uh, when uh, in a, one of his dissents where the Supreme Court on cert a California law. 
Um, he said, for those of us who work in marbled halls, guarded constantly by a vigilant and dedicated police force, the guarantees of the Second Amendment might seem antiquated and superfluous, but the framers made a clear choice. They reserved to all Americans the right to bear arms for self-defense. I do not think we should stand idly by while a state denies its citizens that right, particularly when their very lives may depend on it. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to uh, get Joyce Lee Malcolm's perspective in the conversation. Uh, the next speaker I'd like to ask uh, to make an opening statement is Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz is a professor emerita of ethnic studies at California State University Hayward. During the 1960s and 1970s, she was active in the women's liberation movement and in the American Indian movement. In 1974, she accepted a position as assistant professor in the newly established Native Studies program at California State University at Hayward. Dunbar Ortiz has authored and edited more than a dozen books about feminism, history, and Native American rights including Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz will argue that the Second Amendment to the US Constitution created a constitutional right for white settlers to be armed in settler organized militias for the purpose of continuing violently to appropriate lands from indigenous peoples and to form slave patrols to control enslaved Africans spawning modern police forces. Uh, thank you. And thanks um, uh, to Edward Remus for organizing this panel and for inviting me. Uh, greetings to the other panelists and to our audience. Um, so yes, the second amendment to the US constitution did create a constitutional right for white settlers to be armed and to form organized militias, settler organized militias for the purpose of continuing to violently appropriate land from indigenous peoples. From the 1680s, when Barbados slavers found the South, uh, South Carolina colony and introduced slave patrols the colonial citizens militias already existed and were transformed into slave patrols in South Carolina and beyond everywhere uh, in the slave states. I'm a historian uh, trained in history. And as a historian, I think that nothing can be understood about US history or present without the framework of the United States as a settler colonial state and a fiscal military state. That is a capitalist state made for war and expansion. That is particularly true of the second amendment. Instead of parsing what the founders said or wrote about the second amendment at the time of the constitutional Congress it is essential to understand what they took for granted because armed settlers forming militias had already been practiced for nearly 200 years from the first settlement at Jamestown. In a book written in 1800, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in the 1700s, historian Joseph Doddridge, a minister and early settler in the Ohio country wrote, the early settlers on the frontiers of this country were like Arabs of the desert of Africa. In at least two respects, every man was a soldier and from early in the spring to late in the fall was almost continually in arms. Their work was often carried on by parties, each one of them having uh, his rifle and everything else belonging to his wardress. These were deposited in some central place in the field. A sentinel was stationed on the outside of the fence so that on the least alarm, the whole company repaired to their arms and were ready for combat 
with Indians in any moment. Historian Charles Sellers wrote, cheap land held absolutely under the seaboard market's capitalist conception of property swelled patriarchal honor to heroic dimensions in rural America. The father's authority rested on his legal title to the family land, where European peasant land holdings were usually encumbered with obligations to some elite. The American farmer held in fee simple. Supreme in his domain, he was beyond interference by any earthly power. Except for a modest tax and an occasional half day of neighborhood road work or, carous or, or carousing militia drill, he owed no obligations of labor, money, service, or finally religious fealty to any person or entity. Fee simple land, the augmenting theater of the patriarchal persona, sustained his honor and untrammeled will. This extraordinary independence inflated American farmers' conception of their class far above peasantry. So the founders of the United States picked up where British settler colonization of the 13 colonies had left off with the intention of seizing the continent to reach the Pacific in order to dominate China. This plan and vision is outlined in detail with maps in the Northwest Land Ordinance, which preceded the Constitution, including maps across the continent to the Pacific that was later ratified by Congress. The central goal of settler colonialism is the seizure of land, land that was already densely peopled Violent eradication or removal of the residents and transference to settlers is the genocidal program of settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is a form of Western colonialism initiated first in the Holy Roman Empire's ethnic cleansing of Muslims and Jews in the Iberian Peninsula, igniting the modern era of Western colonialism and imperialism with the Spanish Inquisition investigating what it termed the cleanliness of blood of Muslims and Jews who were forced to convert to Christianity. And settler colonialism was practiced by British colonialism in Ulster, replacing indigenous Irish Catholics with Protestant, Scottish, Welsh, and Anglo settlers, and also in the North American colonies that became the United States. But the United States was the first constitutional republic to implement settler colonialism. Subsequent settler colonial states were formed by the British in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and by late Spanish colonialism in the southern cone of South America. In the 20th century, the now debunked South African apartheid state was formed as a settler colonial regime, as well as the same year, uh, uh, the state of Israel, both copying the US model. Although these separate colonial states were affluent, none were as successful as the United States in developing the largest economy and military in human history. Based in the ethnic cleansing of the native and the use of enslaved labor embedded in a racial code. By 1850, the United States had the largest G uh, GDP in the world grounded in the cotton kingdom and had claimed the current continental geographical boundaries, although it would take 40 more years of war to seize the Intermountain West, Southwest and the Northern Plains from the resistant indigenous residents. The Second Amendment then was an insertion into constitutional law of what already existed in the British colonies, the use of citizens' militias to drive out native people and appropriate their land and later for slave patrols, both of which persisted through the 19th century after the Civil War and emancipation, the Ku Klux Klan served in the, in the place uh, that had been slave patrols. 
The US could have continued these colonialist practices even without the Second Amendment, as these self-organized citizens' militias continued to be the foot soldiers violently taking the land. As long as the US was totally a white ruled republic, the Second Amendment was never at issue or challenged. And there were government, both local, state, federal, regulations of firearms and ammunition. Although white US citizens had far more firearms than any other country in the world. And also was the largest producer of firearms for export. However, with the post-World War II rise of the powerful Black freedom movement, which spawned Native and Mexican and other civil rights movements, white power had to cede rights that had previously been possessed exclusively by the white majority. This in turn gave rise to white nationalist organizations, such as the John Birch Society and their affiliated armed Minutemen, among others and many more in the 1970s to today being awash in firearms and armed white nationalists. The NRA, the National Rifle Association, pretty much a benign organization of recreational hunters and gun collectors, albeit predominant, experienced a coup in the mid 1970s by a white nationalist group Harlan Carter's Second Amendment Foundation that seized leadership. Only then did the Second Amendment begin emerging as a weapon in the racist backlash to the liberation movements. Settler colonialism produces extreme cultural violence, which contributes to the sanctif sanctification of the Second Amendment. The culture of violence is inherent to colonialism of any type and becomes primarily homicidal with settler colonialism and the racial regime of African enslavement. In a way, the Second Amendment turned out to be a time bomb that had little meaning or utility while white supremacy reigned absolute. But after the US Supreme Court decision, to desegregate schools in 1953 and other gains of the Black Freedom Movement, the Second Amendment was seized upon by white nationals, including, including local and state officials as a legal tool to preserve or restore white dominance. The NRA contends that not only safety, but freedom is ensured by the Second Amendment and gun ownership. Because, of the federal, because the federal government, especially the judiciary in the beginning was a conduit for civil rights reforms victories, white nationalist organizations, as well as elected officials in the former Confederate states and in Indian country west of the Mississippi adopted anti-federal government politics. The NRA was a part of that trajectory that sought to shrink federal government powers again, focusing on the Supreme Court, but increasingly dominating US Congress and the presidency. Freedom was and is the watchword for this white nationalist agenda, freedom from the federal government, which has led to the related neoliberal politics of privatization of public goods. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne, much appreciated. Um, the next speaker I would like to turn to for the opening statement is Jack Rakoff. Um, Jack Rakoff is William Robertson co-professor of history and American studies <coughs> uh, <coughs> at uh, Stanford University where he has taught since 1980. He is the author of six books, including Original Meanings, Politics, and Ideas in the Making of the Constitution, which won the Pulitzer Prize in History, and Revolutionaries, A New History of the Invention of America, which was a finalist for the George Washington Prize. And he is also the editor of seven other books. 
An expert on the role of historical knowledge in constitutional litigation, Rakoff was the author of an amicus brief by historians in 2008 uh, in the uh, uh, case DC versus Heller. Jack Rakoff will argue that in its origins, the Second Amendment was exclusively concerned with the status of the militia under the newly adopted federal constitution and had nothing to do with an individual right of self-defense. But over time, as the United States became more of a gun culture, the individual right argument became more attractive and also more salient to the situation of African-Americans. I guess I'm ready to ride and spread the alarm. So, so thanks a lot, Josh. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be at an event sponsored by Northeastern University, which was, as I mentioned uh, before we started, an institution where my dad taught pol political science for a year, uh, and also where my, where my nephew, Max, uh, a native Chicagoan, uh, as I am, was, uh, it was, it was also a student. So as, as Josh said, my starting position is indeed the one uh, that would put me in direct opposition to Joyce Malcolm, with whom I've debated on various occasions over the years. Uh, in, my, in my opinion, and really on the basis of my research in its origins, I believe very firmly uh, that the right to keep and bear arms recognized by the Second Amendment had nothing at all to do with personal defense. Uh, that idea was mentioned occasionally during the ratification debates in 1787 88 and essentially left out of court. Uh, the Second Amendment, as it was discussed you know, in the late 1780s, early 1790s, was always about the militia. It was always about a public institution, which fell generally under the regulation of the states, uh, but which also under the new federal constitution uh, was an institution over which Congress had the authority, uh, legislative authority to organize, arm, and discipline. That's to say the, the militia was a public institution conducted and operated, essentially funded originally, at the state level, but Congress under the constitution was given additional authority to override state legislation, decide how the militia would be organized, armed and disciplined. Why was that power in the constitution to begin with? Uh, being a political historian and historian of the revolution, you know, I, th I think the main point or the main argument I make here uh, is that actually the nature of the militia as, as a vehicle of armed force and, you know, I, I, I suppose this will relate to Roxanne's remarks in a certain sense. What kind of a militia you wanted to have was something that the framers of the Constitution were actively debated, were actively debating. Uh, there was a tradition in colonial law to think of to think of the militia as kind of the body, you know, the 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 adult male population from you know mid to late teens on up to your late fifties, early sixties, uh, all of whom could be mobilized to serve to serve in the militia. But, coming, but given the role that the militia played in the course of the revolution, a lot of critical thought, and see this specifically, people like Alexander Hamilton, uh, when he's writing his essays in the Federalist, the question of what kind of militia would you want to have became an, uh, became an active subject of debate. Did you want to, would you want to have a general militia like that? Or would you actually have what was called at the time a select militia? But the difference here is if you have a general militia, the likelihood it's going to be well-trained, well-disciplined, well-regulated in the sense in which that term was used in the 18th century would decrease. If you have the whole population turning out, the idea that they're going to train a whole adult male free population turning out, the idea that they're going to train effectively or intensely, uh, that their drills are going to be anything more than drinking bouts, uh, you know, would, you know, would decline. If you have a select militia, that's to say you cull the percentage of the population you want to serve and you train them more intensively, you're more likely to get an effective vehicle. Uh, so this is, I think, the major concern the framers had. It explains why Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16 of the Constitution uh, covers the militia in this sense, that you wanted to think creatively about how you would use it. You might use it for insidious purposes, you know, the kind that Roxanne uh, was just describing. And, you know, I'm not sure I have some reservations about her account, but I, I don't think I quarrel uh, you know, with the overall message. So that means that the states were left free to maintain their own militia. Now, in the course of debating that uh, during the, you know, the uh, 1787, 1788, this issue did acquire a certain sensitivity in the South. Uh, if in Southern society, where, you know, where, where the preponderance of American slaves were still residing, uh, and who would number anywhere from 40, 50, even 60% of the population in select counties, uh, particularly, particularly in the Tidewater counties and the seaboard counties, uh, seaboard counties, you know, the danger of slave insurrection, 
which to some extent the American Revolution reinforced is part of is one of the working fears. So the question of the status of the militia and what kind you know what kind of um, you know what kind of support, what kind of uh, you know financial and otherwise it would obtain from the national government in the South was certainly a serious issue. So the idea of having a well-regulated militia can be correlated, you know, it says, you know, you know does, does conflate uh, with the idea of living in a slave society where the fear of slave rebellion is, you know, is an active part of society. But on the other hand, there's also a deeper argument that actually goes all the way back to the 16th century. It's really rooted in the writings of Niccolo Machiavelli, uh, the great political scientist in the early 16th century, really, you know, remarkable figure who I spent a lot of time studying. Machiavelli was uh, a major critic of standing armies and mercenary armies, which were the dominant form uh, of armed force, you know, back, you know, back in his day, uh, particularly when, when Italy was being subject to all kinds of foreign invasions. So Machia Machiavelli was a major advocate of the idea that uh, to have a, a free state, as the Second Amendment recognizes, or uno libero stato, uh, a free state, uh, meaning a state that would, you know, a state that could defend itself based on the virtue, you could say the virtue, but really the virtue of its own citizens. The militia played a, 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 an important role in Machiavelli's thinking about how would you maintain a republic? And with Machiavelli's at source, that idea of the relationship between Republican government and the militia became part of the working political vocabulary uh, of the American founders. Um, Finally, I, well, not finally yet, but you know, I also want to argue, and this again is in opposition to what Joyce Malcolm said. Uh, when you talk about the right of the people in the 18th century, it did not mean the right of all persons. People and all persons you know, are not synonymous terms. How do we know this? You open the Constitution, read Article 1, which is about Congress, Section 2, which is about the House of Representatives. Section 2 tells us that the House of, you know, that the House of Representatives will be elected by the people of the United States. But nobody in the 18th century, or indeed for much later, would say the people of the United States means either all adult uh, citizens or even all adult males. Uh, the people have a right to choose their representatives, but the question of who exercises that right it's not a universal right. The states remain responsible for determining who actually gets to exercise the right to vote. There's a general theory what the, when the Constitution uses a term, it uses it consistently throughout the whole text. So people does not mean all persons. Um, now, over time, what I do argue, and, and what I believe is the case, is that as you go into the 19th century, the United States does become more of a gun culture, to use a phrase that scholars sometimes invoke. The idea of a right of personal self-defense did become a more paramount legal concern. Uh, it's made more practicable uh, if, in fact, individuals can, can carry firearms. One of the things worth knowing here is, it seems to me, if you wanted to protect yourself in the 18th century, you would not want to rely on a firearm. You'd be better off with a knife and better off with an ax because they're all single shot mechanisms and it takes a long time uh, to load one and to prepare one. You know, if, if you either want to protect your family or God forbid murder them, you'd be better off having, you know, having an ax, uh, an ax or a knife to do it. The idea of relying on a firearm would be kind of a bad joke. So the idea that firearms as we know them would become the principal vehicle of self-defense is itself, it seems to me, a rather silly, uh, or at least, you know, somewhat anachronistic notion. Now, uh, you know, since the particular concern of this panel is with issues of race, and you know, we do have a Chicago venue here, uh, I suppose the, the couple of additional points uh, I'd, I'd want to make here uh, is that Afro Americans, as a people, it, it does seem to me, uh, do have a kind of special relationship or do have a, a, a particular, peculiar relationship with firearms. On the one hand, you could say, as objects either of the Fugitive Slave Act, particularly free African-Americans living north of the Ohio River, who always ran the risk of being kidnapped uh, and, you know, uh, and you know, hauled, hauled back across the Ohio uh, into slavery, or in the context of Reconstruction, you know, when, when, when uh, Southern whites start organizing to repress the, the emancipated population. It does seem that African-Americans as a people do we have a kind of particular, interesting, often tragic history uh, in terms of the relationship to firearms. The idea that the Second Amendment could protect African, you know, could be extended to protect African Americans when they became subject to the violence, let's say the Ku Klux Klan and similar organizations haunted the reconstruction itself. That's a very powerful idea. Uh, and one I think one has to reckon with you know, in terms of how we think about race relations. On the other hand, we think about the situation in contemporary Chicago, and it, I, I'm glad you gave the facts of the McDonald case earlier, Josh. 
uh, it seems to me that you know the you know the whole complexity of firearm violence uh, on the south side and the west side, both of which I know quite well because I lived in Hyde Park and I lived in Austin when I was a, when I was a boy growing up in Chicago. The whole the whole question of gang violence and its impact uh, on uh, you know on the African American community is a very troubling question. Um, to my way of thinking, to kind of try to summarize uh, my remarks, um, I guess I'd, I'd, I guess I'd want to make uh, well at least three key points. First is I happen to think that DC versus Heller was wrongly decided. That the whole idea that the Second Amendment was construed to protect an individual right of self-defense is just poppycock. That's not what they were debating. No one at the time thought when they discussed the Second Amendment that they were talking about your right to protect yourself within your own house. They would all be adequately governed by ordinary common law considerations of the rights of self-defense, uh, including actually the stand to the, you know, the retreat to the wall doctrine. Uh, so th that whole, that, you know, this whole idea generated by the NRA, and I think actually by scholar scholars like, like Joyce Malcolm, is just fundamentally misbegotten. The Second Amendment was always about the militia. It was never conceived in its origins to have anything to say about a personal right of self-defense. Secondly, a point I have not made, in the 18th and 19th century, and I think on down today, and actually we're discussing this in terms of the pandemic, uh, Americans had a very healthy conception of what was called the uh, police power, or sometimes referred to as the internal police power. The police power, as the term was used then, doesn't simply mean can you call the cops, do you dial 911, and a squad car will come rolling by your house because you're in some kind of personal danger or whatever. The police power means that all governments were thought to have a robust, particularly state governments, were thought to have a robust legislative authority to act in behalf of public health and safety. The idea, therefore, that the regulation of gun usage, gun access, where and whether you can carry it, whether you can be licensed to carry it, whether your, your ability to, to carry it openly uh, could be restricted, um, that would be a perfectly acceptable norm of legislative action in the 18th and 19th century. The idea that the Second Amendment would have reduced or circumscribed that norm, I also think, is constitutional pop, poppycock. And the Tenth Amendment, you know, which reserves, you know, which, 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 uh, which says power is not delegated to the actual government or reserved to the people of the states, would adequately cover that. Finally, the obvious point to be made, and, and you know, is that... Uh, if, there, if there's any one clause in the Constitution which has been made anachronistic by virtue of technology, it's really the Second Amendment. You cannot compare what a firearm could do in the 18th century uh, with what automatic weapons can do today. Anybody who knows anything about the use of the AR-15, and when I was in the Army briefly back in 1968, when I did the so-called Fort Knox boogie, you know, two months of basic training and, you know, two months, and, you know, served in the U.S. Army Reserves, uh, I mean, I fired the M14. That weapon is not, you know, it's not like firing a 22. It's not like firing an ordinary handgun. The kind of the, the bullets you, you fire are, are designed to kill. They're designed to do maximum tissue damage. The idea that you cannot regulate their use because people happen to like having an automatic weapon once you know how devastating they are to anybody who's at the receiving end, uh, that's another one of those issues that we really need to wrestle with. So the idea that you could take an 18th century notion of a firearm a much less dangerous thing to use then that's become today. And then simply plug that mentality in the present, to me, is also nonsense. And on that uh, sobering note, I'll conclude my remarks for the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. Much appreciated. Uh, we'll hear our um, last open of the opening statements from Charles E. Cobb Jr. now. Charles E. Cobb Jr. is a journalist, visiting professor at Brown University, and a senior analyst for the news website allafrica.com. During the 1960s, Cobb worked as a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Mississippi. He began his long career in journalism in the 1970s, reporting for WHUR Radio in Washington, D.C., National Public Radio, the PBS documentary series Frontline, and National Geographic Magazine. Cobb is author of the book, This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible. Charles Cobb will argue the gun debate is muddled and will not lead to any meaningful result. 
Thank you. I'm pleased to be here and appreciate being invited to be here. Uh, yes, I, uh, to begin with, I find the gun debate muddled because it doesn't focus on any of what I would consider central issues, starting with the Second Amendment, which I don't consider if you're talking about ordinary people in their lives today, very important to their decisions about using or not using uh, guns. And I can talk sp very specifically about that later on. I think somewhat controversially to some uh, and perhaps to many that uh, guns don't kill people, people do. It's a shame that this phrasing has been taken over by right-wing proponents of the Second Amendment and so-called rights that accompany the Second Amendment. However, my own embrace of this idea grows out of my deep involvement in the Southern Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s as a SNCC field secretary or field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We lived with families in private homes, mostly the homes of poor people, and I'd be hard pressed to name a home that did not have a gun. Uh, and when people talked about the guns they had, they were not speaking in terms of the Second Amendment. And, and sometimes it was almost contradictory. I can remember being in home, somebody's cleaning a rifle and saying he's a part of the nonviolent movement. Uh, I think it's, it, but this phrase has been taken over. However, my involvement of the Southern Civil Rights Movement would give me a completely different attitude toward both the Second Amendment and the right to bear, bear arms. As I said, guns were widespread in the South, uh, a deep part of Southern culture. The guns we worried about, however, were those in the hands of the Ku Klux Klan and the like. That was a problem. These people used their guns to kill. The other side of this, of course, is that the black people we stayed with had guns, as I said, and often used their guns to protect themselves and us. Only once during, oh, five years, almost five years of organizing in Mississippi, did I have occasion to refer to the Second Amendment. And I tell that story in my last book, so I'll spare you the details of that uh, story here. Let me just say here at this point that the absence of the long history of African-American gun use is part of what keeps discussions of guns and gun violence in the United States so muddled. In popular discussion and debate in the US, there was never much discussion over uh, uh, the Second Amendment. The NRA, however, changed that in the middle 1970s when it was taken over by extremists at its annual conference on May 21, 1977, what is sometimes called the revolt in Cincinnati took place. Gun rights extremists wearing orange hunting caps took over the organization and the NRA changed from a largely non-political organization, primarily focused on gun safety, hunting, conservation, and marksmanship to the lobbying organization it is today extreme and absolutist in its advocacy of so-called Second Amendment rights. This was really part of a growing right-wing political surge that began with Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan in the 1960s, reacting to the anti-war movement, civil rights and black power movements, the Black Panther Party, the feminist movement, and gay rights movement that had been emerging with growing strength. This reaction, still with us today, can have terrifying manifestations that reveal the violence threaded throughout U.S. culture. A few years ago, for example, when Barack Obama was president, uh, Reverend Stephen L. Anderson, a faithful word Baptist church in Tempe, Arizona, said in a Sunday sermon, he titled, Why I Hate Barack Obama. Quote, I'm not going to pray for his good. I'm going to pray he dies and goes to hell. The next day, a member of Anderson's congregation showed up at an Obama speech in Arizona with an AR-15 rifle and a pistol 
He said he brought the weapons to exercise his right to bear arms. This deserves really an emphatic crude response, but I'll refrain, confining myself to just uttering, that's BS. I ask you though, does it really matter what kind of weapon he brought? We see something like this over, uh, we see something like this over and over again from the so-called conservative right today, hypocritically proclaiming the need to defend Second Amendment rights with expressions of fear and hostility, fear of immigrants, of black people, of a government they consider inherently oppressive. NRA head Wayne LaPierre defended gun rights at the Conservative Political Action uh, Conference just a week after the Parkland, Florida shootings, denouncing Barack Obama, media, Hollywood, European style socialist control of the Democratic Party, philanthropist businessman George Soros, former New York City mayor Michael Bloomberg, Mexicans, China, Black Lives Matter, and NFL players. Not much about the Second Amendment in his remarks, but he does have a First Amendment right that has to acknowledge to express himself no matter how backward his thoughts. What Kyle Rittenhouse, now on trial for the murder of protesters, came to to Canoba, Wisconsin from Illinois and was allowed to walk in their midst with an automatic weapon. Police did nothing to stop him. And, and that's a more worrisome uh, concern on my part than, than Second Amendment issues. And let me note here that former President Donald Trump's embrace of the January 6th insurrectionists continues this tradition of ignorance and racism. I only ask that it not be thought of or called conservative. Although race and racism describe much of what we hear from Second Amendment advocates, the larger and more important discussion needed is about democracy. Although we can point fingers at opponents of any sort of gun control, more dangerous is the emergence of powerful anti-democratic forces, not just in our political system, but actively subverting it. So given this reality today, how should we focus a real discussion of guns and gun violence? And, and I have to acknowledge here as, as, as the grandfather of five grandkids, violence, you know, in this country and the implications of violence, especially with guns for the future is number one on my list of concerns. And when I raise that, I'm, I'm not raising a discussion. I'm not, I don't enter into debates about Second Amendment rights uh, uh, on that. Uh, so, you know, uh, gun violence has unquestionably grown and more guns are in more hands, but it remains unproven whether the latter is the primary cause of the former. Start with basic fact instead of political hysteria to consider a few of these facts. There are more than 300 million guns in private hands, yet there are just, and I use that word cautiously and reluctantly, there are just a little more than 30,000 gun deaths annually, both a horrifyingly large number and a relatively small number given how many guns are in private hands. About half of gun deaths are suicides. Coherent discussion should begin with these numbers. Gun deaths vary greatly by gender, race, class, and geography. C to C, CDC 2013 figures, and they haven't changed that much, put homicide as the cause of 19% of white gun deaths, suicide at over 80%. In the US black population, however, just 14% of gun deaths are due to suicide, 82% are homicides. And most of these homicides are in the poorest quarters of urban inner cities. So what should be pushed forward in discussion of gun violence and gun rights? And as I said, in inner cities, mostly populated by poor black and brown people, the problem of gun violence seems to have grown at least in part 
in large part, I think, because of society's willful refusal to create a level playing field. Banning certain types of weapons will not solve the issues of rage, alienation, and lack of opportunities that underlie such problems. As I once heard Nation of Islam's leader, Louis Farrakhan remark, if you create a jungle, don't be surprised if there are predators in it. And that's the reason in neighborhoods like mine, not a jungle by any stretch of the imagination, but a predominantly black working class com community with a substantial number of retirees, so many households have guns. And let me say here that while I have great concern over the violence that exists in some inner city communities, I do not use the term black on black violence. We do not, after all, say white on white violence. We know the connection between the desperation that exists in some of these communities and violence. To control guns and violence in them, we have to deal with the causes of this desperation. Otherwise, we are kidding ourselves. Uh, pissing in the wind, so to speak, as they used to say, at least in the South. But getting back to the topic of this gathering, uh, I think actually only a militarized confiscation will even begin to remove the hundreds of millions of guns in private hands. And I think that is impossible. It may be possible, however, to achieve some limited forms of gun control. I like to suggest mandatory gun insurance, national registration and proficiency testing, a 21-year-old age requirement, and tough penalties for the wrongful use of guns. There is, in fact, strong support among gun owners for common sense gun control, which is what these suggestions I'm making are. This support could form the basis for coherent discussion, but so far congressional cowardice has presented, prevented that. But in any case, real gun control, that which could reduce or end gun violence, in the end requires a values revolution, a radical humanistic reset of our thoughts and behavior toward ourselves and others. In this very society we live in is remarkably violent. And that's a deep cultural facet and factor of this society. So what I'm suggesting is not an abstract idea, though not something that will occur overnight, but a principle of struggle. And that's what I am, an organizer, always have been. Slow, difficult struggle that should guide our way toward meaningful gun control through making a better nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles, and uh, all of our panelists for their opening statement. Now we're going to uh, let them circle back and uh, make a, basically a three to five minute uh, rebuttal where they can uh, clarify their statements uh, with respect to what others have said or uh, point out lines of agreement and disagreement with what with respect to what others have said. So we'll go in the same order um, and we'll kick it off with Joyce Lee Malcolm, uh, who uh, recorded her, uh, her comments and uh, we'll have Ed play them now. I'll just uh, respond to the, the two pricey that you gave me of Jack Rakoff and um, Roxanne Dunbar. Um, first of all, neither of the other speakers mentions these two Supreme Court landmark cases. They completely ignore Heller and McDonald. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's quite tragic when you ignore a Supreme Court case, you don't even deal with it. You just simply pretend it didn't happen. Jack Rakoff, goes right back to the idea that there is no individual right, only a collective right for the militia, uh, which is now the National Guard to be able to be armed. And then he claims that the only reason that there's some belief it's an individual right was because in the 19th century, there was a change in what he called a gun culture. 
that goes right back to Michael Valeo's discredited book, Arming America. Right from the beginning and before that, when they came to this country, Americans and the colonists believed and knew that one of their rights was a right to their own personal self-defense. Um, as far as Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz uh, goes, she also ignores the Supreme Court's history. I should add to that the Second Amendment was not created to attack other groups. It was a right of the Englishmen and a right of the colonists to protect themselves and their families. It was a right of self-defense. The, the militia um, was a home guard. It was not organized in order to go off and take other people's property or keep other people down. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, blacks living on the frontier had guns in their home for protection. In the North, they were able to be armed and fought during the revolution and slavery in the North ended in the early 19th century. Um, the second amendment did not, as she puts it, morph into the police. The second amendment militia became the National Guard and is now actually under the purview of the uh, Ar US Army. So it was never a, pol a police force. It was never an army. It was meant to be a kind of citizen militia for self-defense and, um, and to protect the people. And I would say to her that she's entitled to her own opinions, but she is not entitled to her own facts. And she has made some serious mistakes about the facts. So I, I hope she will um, rethink that. Um, and then finally, um, the individual needs need to protect themselves. It's the most basic right and has always been considered the most basic right the law cannot be there to protect everyone. Police cannot be there in your moment of need. So the law recognizes uh, that in that ultimate moment, you need to be able to protect yourself. And the Second Amendment is there to guarantee that when you have that need, that you are actually able to do that. You have some means of protecting yourself. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, we can now hear from uh, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz in her uh, response to the opening comments. Yeah, I was thinking while Joyce was talking, um, where are her facts? And then she said, I had none. Well, um, I, I think um, she's denying the entire uh, U.S. history by simply saying everything is British and uh, um, without seeming to know anything about the British colonization of Ireland, also stripping uh, Irish of any self-defense, uh, arming uh, settlers. So, um, but on to the Second Amendment. Um, I, am, I will emphasize that I do uh, I really loved uh, uh, um, Jack's, uh, Jack Rocco's uh, presentation, but I do disagree about the uh, individual right. I do think the Second Amendment definitely it does uh, provide a, uh, an individual right because it's in the Bill of Rights. Uh, Article 8 of the Constitution provides for uh, the state militias uh, that became the National Guards. So why would you repeat in the Bill of Rights, individual rights, something that's already in the Constitution if it's not about an individual? I would say, too, I think the Second Amendment was, should be done away with. So I'm not saying that I support individual <laughs> right uh, to carry guns. I think we're washing guns and it's terrifying if the Supreme Court uh, strikes down the New York law. And that means that all of us throughout the country here in California, we're semi safe, although there it's a wash in illegal guns. Uh, but um, and the first 15 minutes of any news show uh, locally is uh, on Mondays, which I watched this morning, is an account of um, all of the shootings over the weekend. So um, 
I, I, um, I think the Second Amendment is embedded in, in, in British and in US colonialism. And if that is structure, if that framework is not understood, I just don't think you're doing US history. You're talking about some other country, you know. Surely there's a reason why there is no country in the world, even those at war, that have that many guns in individual hands, 300 million it's estimated, although no one knows for sure, for 330 million people. But in fact, only a third, only 100 million actually own even one gun. So it's important to understand who owns the guns and why it's important to them. I heard uh, one of the white nationalists, uh, NRA people, make the statement. It's very clear. It says, all, it's all we have left as white people. And he meant descendants of, of the settlers, not white immigrants. I know exactly. I come from rural Oklahoma. <laughs> I grew up a sharecropper's daughter. I know these people and I know exactly what the Second Amendment means to them. It means policing non-white people without the police. The police, is another problem, you know, a separate problem uh, from the armed, uh, armed civilians. You'll never, by the way, Jack, forget about gun laws. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to close down or control, or maybe it was Charles. It's not going to happen in the United States unless there's some kind of revolution. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, <clears throat> let us uh, I'll turn to Jack Rakoff uh, for his response. Sure. Well, let me uh, let me make a, a, a few points in my in my Chicago style rapid delivery <laughs> fashion if I if I can do that. So first off, let's look. Let's let's go back to the late 1780s, 1790s. That's I spent most of my waking hours in those years thinking about thinking about the debates. You know, and my, and my point. I have a couple points against Joyce. It's too bad she's. She can't go live with us. Uh, the first is that um, that's what they were discussing. When the Second Amendment was being debated, which it is in, in different phases, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the most pressing issue, but it was debated. It was always in terms of the militia. And it was never about a personal right of self-defense. So the question is, why does a particular clause or a particular provision make its way into the Constitution? I think I have a pretty compelling story to, to tell about what they thought they were actually discussing. If you want to talk about personal rights of self-defense, as, as I try to say in better marks, there are a lot of ways you can do that. I mean, there's there are all kinds of common law doctrines and no common law, meaning you know, the ordinary course of Anglo-American jurisprudence. There are lots of ways you can do it with existing common law doctrines. The, you know, not 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 every subject of common law has to make its way into the Constitution. The reason the Second Amendment does. Is because it is tied to these, you know, these this this larger body of tradition uh, about um, the role of the militia in a republican society and the lessons learned from the revolution. So that's kind of point number one. Um, point number two is Joyce also makes a fundamental error, which, given that she's trained as a historian of 17th century England, uh, strikes me as being really rather remarkable. I mean, she, in her earlier remarks, she cited an 18th century case, you know, affirming, you know, an individual right of self-defense, that's fine. But any, you know, the whole point of the Declaration of Rights of 1688, which represented the original form of trying to, in effect, constitutionalize, I use that term loosely, trying to constitutionalize uh, a right to bear arms. The whole point of the Declaration of Rights was not to affirm the, the sovereignty of an individual right over and against government regulation. In the Anglo-American tradition, uh, the point of the Declaration of Bill of Rights was to, was to affirm the sovereignty of parliament, the law-giving body. Uh, an individual cannot invoke the Declaration of Rights, an English subject, 
If they were subjects, remember, not citizens. An English subject could not invoke the Declaration of Rights of 1688 to countermand uh, a parliamentary act. Parliament passes all kinds of acts in, in, in the 18th century, regulating gun use, all kinds of hunting, you know, laws regulating hunting, for example. The idea that uh, the, the right is we use the term under, let's say, Congress shall make no law. That concept was not yet available in Anglo-American thinking until you get to the late 1780s. So approaching this as a constitutionalist, which is my main enterprise these days as a scholar, Joyce's argument, I think rather surprisingly, even depressingly, is actually nonsense. Uh, it doesn't actually capture you know, how people thought in these terms. And the other point I want, you know, I, I think I want to make one remark, yet, well, maybe a couple of quick remarks the opposite of, you know, uh, both Roxanne and, uh, and, and, and Charles. I think in Roxanne's case, um, I, I don't fully understand why you need the Second Amendment to justify public action, that's to say the use of force against, you know, under the, you know, the, the guise of settler colonialism, uh, when other, other mechanisms were already available. Uh, I mean, it seems to me it's the cavalry more than the militia that, you know, that, that, that bear the brunt and the burden. It's the U.S. Army more than state institutions. And maybe I'm wrong about this. I don't know. But it's, I, that's, you know, that's kind of my story here. Right? You know, I don't think, you know, I don't think individuals bearing rifles into the fields are going to have adequate, you know, if they're to be attacked by uh, indigenous peoples, they're not going to be able to uh, protect themselves very well. Oh, I see the opening scene of the searchers as the, the classic film statement. Uh, of the you know the great movie, John Huston's great movie you know uh, on that um, and, and you know I think just uh, just quickly in, in, in response to Charles um, it is a mess and I'm just an 18th century historian I have no idea what gun policy I would pursue but there is a there is a growing body of literature and sentiment out there and Justice Thomas I think represents this better than anybody else that says not only do we have the specific Second Amendment right wrongly recognized in DC versus Heller and reaffirmed in you know, McDonald versus Chicago or whatever. Um, uh, there is some body of Second Amendment rights in the plural out there waiting to be discovered. Like, this, like the Second Amendment is not just you know, a sufficient evil unto itself. It's, it's kind of an open, it's an open door to enlarge the realm of, the realm of rights we want to, uh, gun rights we want to protect legally uh, and constitutionally, and it just again, let's go back and said it seems to me that the, a, a deep part of the American Anglo-American uh, political constitutional tradition is to say that the, the police power of the state. And again, we've seen this so much in evidence in the debates over COVID. The idea, of the, the responsibility, and the power of state, of state, state, and local governments to protect our health and safety. That's something we want to enlarge legislatively. So I agree that a lot of the discussion about the second, Charles, a lot of the discussion about the Second Amendment is nonsense. But it's certain, you know, for figurative purposes or otherwise, it still seems to serve a vital function, as a, or a symbolic function, but a non-trivial function in terms of, you know, how you know how people today. Maybe this wasn't true in the '60s, but certainly given the changes that have taken place with the NRA. Uh, it does seem to occupy a bigger part of the public consciousness. And, you know, when Trump and others say you got to protect the Second Amendment, I, you know, I, I don't think that's just some kind of rhetorical trope they're dealing with anymore. I mean, I think it has some sub some substantive impact. It does. Um, the use of that phrase, where you know, you watch these guys in Jacksonville. It's mostly guys when I see yeah, them. Right. Uh, uh, in these rooms with their weapons and all of that and their Confederate flags and all of it. Uh, and they're claiming, you know, they have the Second Amendment right to, to bear arms and so forth. It certainly appeals to that category of people who also agree with, with, with Donald Trump that the January 6th attack on the Capitol was the opening shot a necessary revolution that will, again, borrowing Trump's term, make America great again. But in many communities, like the community I live in, the Second Amendment has no existence in terms of people's decision about, I would say in my neighborhood, uh, which is an, an urban inner city neighborhood in Florida, 90% of the people have weapons at home and the second amendment <laughs> just doesn't have any existence to understanding why they have the weapons. And, you know, so there, there really are two 
levels of discussion. One is what's going on in the lives of ordinary people, regular people who choose to buy a weapon, whether it's an automatic weapon or a pistol of some sort. And then what's going on in the use, and this is how I mostly see it, the use of the Second Amendment to facilitate an assault on a country, uh, really, quite frankly, that they feel they're losing their grips on. What, what, what I hear here in this city, uh, you know, the, the country isn't white enough or it's not, <laughs> you know, the, the kind of power that existed has been taken from them by, by whatever, immigrants, black people or whatever. And ambitious politicians like Donald Trump have learned how to very effectively manipulate these fears uh, and concerns. And, and the Second Amendment is a handy way to do that. But when these politicians here, I live in the South, speak about Second Amendment rights, they're not speaking to my neighborhood. <laughs> you know, they're not. And when, and when people, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not living in a high crime area or anything, even though there are a lot of guns around. Uh, when, when, when people, you know, talk about the guns they have, you know, they're not referring at any respect to me uh, about Second Amendment rights. In, in some ways, it's rather similar to the way people had guns way back in the 1960s. I mean, you know, everybody had guns and it was part of day-to-day -day life. And again, there wasn't, wasn't any discussion about that. That's, but I think, you know, uh, and I think you probably can't, cannot get that kind of discussion in this uh, society. I make a point. Um, I just want to clarify that when I say the Second Amendment is an individual right, I do not mean for self-defense ah. at all. Rather, the right for white people to uh, kill Indians and take their land, and I'll explain that, and uh, to control enslaved people. I recommend Carol Anderson's book, The Second, which is on the Second Amendment. She documents in some detail, she's a historian, um, and she documents in detail that I had never seen before of uh, the insurrections that were taking place when the Constitution was being written as a major uh, motivation to have individuals be able to police, have them serve in pay, uh, slave patrols, have them serve in militias. No, there was no big standing army, Jack. That is a historical fact that it was a, um, uh, was a uh, ragtag army. Settlers had a self-interest in taking land. Land was valuable. Real estate was the basis of US capitalism and still is. Land, unlike any other society in the world, land was divided, platted into rectangles to be sold with deeds that was new under the sun. So it's sector colonialism is very, very central to understanding anything about the constitution, period. And I recommend really reading Greg Abraski uh, in some detail, and especially for individual responsibility. It's a responsibility and a right. Uh, they have a self-interest in this, you know, and in controlling. There was some resentment on the part of people who, who could not afford to purchase enslaved bodies for having to patrol, but it was also in their interest to control black people. And so they served in these patrols. So I do not mean that there's any semblance 
of, of individuals right to self-defense. I do not think the Second Amendment has anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole problem with the gun rights question today is that it's about self-defense, it's not. Right. Roxanne um, and, and other panelists, thank you so much. Um, I would like to, uh, if, if I may, um, we have uh, one uh, more comment that we'd like to bring in, a brief comment of Joyce Lee Malcolms on uh, the McDonald versus uh, Chicago case and the disparate impact issue that I think uh, relates to some of what you three are saying. Uh, and I would like to play that for just a couple minutes and then I would like to invite our audience to uh, write in their questions and uh, Ed Remus will start selecting a few and reading them uh, to our panelists so that we can bring in uh, the audience and uh, hear your responses to, to what they'd like to uh, hear about from you. So uh, let's uh, shift it back to uh, Joyce Lee Malcolm who's uh, very much here with us in spirit and uh, technologically. <laughs> When I mentioned disparate impact, I thought that's exactly what they use talking about other things, but it is that because if you are being so careful about who can get a gun, you can imagine that the people who actually do are important people, they're wealthy people, they're not the poor guy who lives, you know, like Otis McDonald, and I, I didn't have a chance to mention him, but he was, you know, an African American, 72 years old, he had been robbed several times, he was an activist. He wanted some means of protecting himself. So that's the McDonald from the case. And, um, and you can see why people, particularly if they're trying to clean up their neighborhood and the drug dealers know who you are, <laughs> you know, you really live in fear. And, you know, it, it seems to me really unfair that these laws should be used to keep the very people who most need to protect themselves from being able to do that. So. That is my shtick, but, I, I, but I'm sorry I didn't get in about Otis because Roxanne seems to feel that this is a racist thing, but yet the people who really need this are often people who are minorities living in really dangerous areas. Other people maybe can get further away, you know. Um, I, I'm just curious if Roxanne or uh, Charles or Jack uh, have a, a response to uh, the essence of Joyce Lee Malcolm's claim that you know, in if you take cases like Otis McDonald, it's you know poor people uh, who live in high uh, crime areas who are you know um, impeded by uh, gun regulations in her uh, in her framing of the discussion. How would you respond to that? What I would want to know, you, I, Josh, maybe you said something about this in the outset or somebody mentioned it. I mean, you look, know, as I said before, I'm just an 18th century guy. I'm, I'm mostly concerned with the origins of the Constitution, but I am aware of the consequences. Wow. You know, you or somebody else said, look, suppose you take any given firearm, what, what, is, what is the relative likelihood of it being used, A, for purposes of self-defense against an external threat, or B, being used accidentally, either to commit suicide on the one hand or because some kid gets hold of it and blows away his little brother or his parent. I mean, I would actually like to see the data in terms of, you know, what, you know, I mean, you know, I, I understand the rationale for McDonald, but I'd still want to know. I mean, I read, you know, you know, I don't have a subscription to the Chicago Trib, but mostly I'd want to follow the Cubbies you know, their ups and their downs, their lows and their highs or whatever. But, you know, I know enough about, you know, what goes on on the Chicago streets on the South side and the West side, areas I used to live in as a kid, uh, to know that, you know, a lot of people are killed accidentally. And every fatality is a tragedy. And all the survivors in that family have to deal with it. Uh, and so I just, you know, and, and, you know, other societies, you know, not unlike ours, places like Scott, you know, it's to say, let's say Anglo dominated societies like Australia or Scotland, when they've had gun tragedies, have been able to deal with them sensibly. We're incapable of that. And you know, I mean, Charles, you know, and, you know, I mean, in different ways, you know, I think Charles and Roxanne 
uh, probably have good explanations sociologically, historically, for why that's the case. But you know, my 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 underlying belief is that we have a compelling public policy problem involving the exceptional use of firearms in our culture. And although I can't say, I don't know what the answer is, but the idea that we should be constrained from trying to answer it because people erect these kind of mythical constitutional objections to it strikes me as being utter nonsense and highly dysfunctional. Yeah, but I don't ever to use. I don't see that as a gun discussion. You know, if you look at, and, and I, I agree with you, I would like to see numbers. How many people are killed by stray bullets? How many people are killed accidentally? All of that, I don't, maybe they exist. I don't know where they exist. Uh, but the problem I see when you look at where the bulk of gun violence and gun death is, is in the poorest of the poor in black and brown communities. Not even, if you, even in, in, in Jacksonville, where I live, I mean, there's certain neighborhoods where the violence is extraordinary in the sense of the, the number of gun incidents and the number of people who are killed, even though there are other poor neighborhoods where you don't have that mm -hmm. at all. So that, to me, the toleration of places like that are where the problem is, and we've never been able to tackle all the stuff that grows out of poverty, the alienation, you know, and, and the anger and all that. And we've certainly never been able to, to tackle as a society how guns and violence are romanticized. This country is unique, I think, in the way it romanticizes mm -hmm. violence. It's, it's unique in that respect. And we've never figured out a way to tackle that problem. And, and where I was, I was in a poor, I was actually out of the country, but in a very poor neighborhood in Jamaica years ago. And there was a really crappy cowboy movement movie playing in the theater. And this kid insisted that I, he wanted to take me to the movie. And the, and the bad guys and the good guys are shooting each other. And he joins in the shoot. He pulls a pistol out of his pocket and starts to fire at the screen. <laughs> now, that's what I mean. I mean, I think there's a lot of that that goes on between uh, uh, social media and the kind of vi violence you can enter into in that media, the way... When I was a kid, it was cowboys and Indians and gangsters and all of that. It was the same thing. We've never figured out how to deal with the cultural impact of that. That's not an issue of the Second Amendment. And until we do figure out, in my view, a way to deal with that, we're going to be confronted mm -hmm. with this problem of guns and violence in this country. I agree. Um... You know, when everyone knows this story, when Australia, which is also a settler, you know, white men with guns uh, uh, society, um, it, uh, when they had that mass shooting on Tasmania, that was horrific. Um, they, and uh, the government announced, you know, were, uh, were outlawing guns. People turn your guns in and everyone did and they, they uh, destroyed them and they haven't ever changed since. That would never happen in the United States. That's why I say, you got, you got to learn US history and not, not the textbooks that are written by the least people to trust. Writing US history are US trained historians. <laughs> so read Native American scholarship read black scholarship, uh, read my books, <laughs> and you will understand what makes the United States unique in the world. There is no country, I would say right now, even in Yemen, which has been at war for eight years, that there are no significant number of civilians 
with guns. So we have to find a way to understand and acknowledge how do we change this? Not by gun laws, not by parsing the second amendment, but by simply acknowledging the history of the United States and why it's so screwed up right now. Half our budget, uh, half the money we pay goes to militarism. Why is it the most militaristic country ever to exist? And those two are connected, the guns in the hands of civilians and militarism. It's a part of militarism. So I know I sound like I'm preaching, but it's very frustrating when people get caught up on, you know, the say, I think it has nothing to do with the second amendment. I think the second amendment should be abolished because unlike, um, what's her name, who's not here, um, it is totally immersed in racism. There's just no question about it, but so is the whole constitution. And we really need to give some thought to a constitutional convention <laughs> that would, you know, write a constitution that's not filled, you know, with white men of uh, settlers to take the continent and um, kill all the native people down to making them 100% to 2% of the population, that's called genocide. We have to face some realities or we'll never, never deal with this issue and we're destroying the world. Roxanne and uh, Jack and Charles, uh, I would like to uh, invite you to hear some questions now from uh, the audience. And Ed has uh, selected a few that he'll uh, read for us. So I'll turn it over to Ed. Yes, I'd like to give priority to questions that address all the panelists. And one such question is the following. To what extent is Chicago's reputation as having the most restrictive gun laws in the nation justified? It seems that it's widely believed and frequently cited as evidence that gun control laws don't work. But is that true? And on that point, I just want to briefly uh, play a clip, another clip from Joyce, where in which she addresses the situation in Chicago in particular. Even after these two uh, Supreme Court cases, both the DC and Chicago passed very, very bureaucratic and difficult laws to enable people to, to get a gun. So you had to go to the police twice, you had to be fingerprinted, you had to, um, before you could use your gun, you had to have a, take a test, you had to have practice on a gun range and no gun ranges were allowed. <laughs> I mean, they made it as bureaucratically difficult as they could. Uh, and then in Chicago, they decided, and I, I, I don't have the quote, but they decided that no gun could be taken within, I think, 100, 100 yards of any grade school, high school, college, nursery school, park. I mean, by the time you got done, there was almost no place that you could go to actually carry that weapon, you know? So they, they've used all of the um, tricks, I hate to say it, but you know, techniques of government to make it very, very difficult for people to uh, be able to protect themselves. Um, and it's not that there are no guns, obviously there are, but they're not in the hands of law-abiding people. Well, I, you know, I, I don't have any independent data on Chicago to, you know, and to be able to kind of, you know, respond intelligently, except beyond going back to what, uh, you know, I was saying, and I think Charles, uh, you know, was agreeing with it. I mean, it, you know, uh, collecting data on the actual use of firearms, something the Republicans in Congress made virtually impossible to take place, if, if I remember correctly, but I think the current administration is, start, is starting to undo that. I mean, actually knowing how guns are used. I mean, so we, we do have a mythology they're being used for self-defense 
either in the home uh, or on the street. But, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, you'd think if that actually happened with any frequency, you know about it. You know, you, you've learned a lot more about the suicides. We had one, you know, I live on the Stanford campus. We had two people killed by firearms within a block of my house. One just up the street, some guy, some kid, some alienated boyfriend came up and blew his brains out in front of his ex-girlfriend. And then a police involved shooting out here with people going, you know, where some guy tried to steal a car, tried to run down an officer, she had a fire in self-defense. You know, but I just, you know, I, I actually think knowing, have, you know, being a social scientist, having the data would be nice. You could actually draw some reasonable conclusions, you know, and then, you know, kind of test the propositions about are we actually using this for self-defense? I mean, I do think, you know, there are, as I understand it, there are, there are studies of suicide that suggest that the facility of access to firearms probably increases. I mean, I, I might be wrong about this, but I don't think so. That actually having, have, you know, having handguns available probably increases the facility of committing suicide. If, if they were more, if they were squirreled away or not so pervasive, uh, those numbers might actually go down. You know, people commit suicide, they, they, you know, they may do so for momentary passions, which if they survive, they will survive, you know, both of their own self-preservation and uh, the better feelings of their families. I agree. Uh, you know, th and there are issues of class as well as race here. I'm from Washington, D.C. I'm a native of the city, so I, I'm very conscious of, of the kind of kind of violence that has unfolded in Washington. I can't see that the very strict uh, legislation passed by the D.C. City Council has had much of an effect on the level of violence. Uh, in the city. What I am, what is noticeable though, is that the city is gentrifying yeah. at a very rapid rate. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious as to what the implications of that are uh, on, on the level of violence uh, in the city. I mean, I know neighborhoods that when I was a kid, <laughs> I mean, you were scared to walk through. <laughs> Right. Because because there were gangs and and or as they were called in D.C. block boys, uh, and you know you were, well, you were taking your life at at your hand. That are now some of the most expensive neighborhoods uh, in the city. Uh, my first apartment cost me seventy five dollars a month, and when I went to that neighborhood, uh, there was a luxury condominium there. And, and starting at the low 500s, the manager uh, told me. So I'm curious about what impact that might have. But the point is that none of it has to do with either gun legislation or the Second Amendment that I could see. I, I would leave it to scholars to, to pursue that. But I can't see the impact of either gun legislation or the, or the Second Amendment. Uh, I don't think it will stop people. Any restrictions won't stop people from getting firearms if they're afraid and fearful. Well, not the Second Amendment, but you know, I have a colleague, a very distinguished colleague at Stanford, John Donahue, who I you know compare to us occasionally, who does a lot of work on you know quantitative work, he kind of he really kind of metric work on you know, on firearms and violence, and you know there are, there are correlations mm -hmm. between the ease of access and you know, in rates of use. Um, so, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I guess, I, I guess, I'll defer to people more knowledgeable than myself. I'm just observing, you know. I, I, I think oh, that we're so awash in, in guns that, um, that Charles is right. It has nothing to do with the Second Amendment, uh, people who have these guns. Um, it is, you know, as I said before, a white men's thing, a white uh, descendants of the original settlers who care about the Second Amendment because I think it it empowers them uh, to dominate. They believe, and they feel like they're losing dominance. It was you know as as the population gets browner and blacker and not whiter, and. I think that's what we have to deal with. And that's the, uh, but the gun violence goes way back. You know, there's, um, it's, it's, it's unique. And 
you could do, I think the second amendment should be done away with, but I don't think it would have um, any effect whatsoever on the number of guns used, nor would any kind of, of um, laws controlling guns. Uh, I expect in New York right now with that strict law that, <laughs> that it doesn't mean that everyone I know in New York has a gun. And uh, they're not they're not licensed. Uh, it's so easy to get a gun. Just go to a gun show. You don't have to have a license or anything else. And there are gun shows. We have them here in the Bay Area constantly, and they're huge. I recommend everyone visit one sometime and see where people get their guns. They don't have to register them. Mm -hmm. And there are AR fifteens. There's every kind of gun imaginable. Or sale and it's legal. I wonder if um, just incidentally, I happen to know that there were 2,201 convictions under Chicago's handgun ban that McDonald versus Chicago overturned. So that amounted to only 79 per year. Uh, so the law didn't have a huge effect in terms of convictions. But uh, I thought maybe we could ask Ed for another comment from our uh, audience. Yeah, certainly. We have um, we have a few questions here addressing all panelists, and one is: Do you think the Second Amendment debate is largely a distraction, getting in a way, getting in the way of actual reforms? Well, yeah. I mean, in one obvious sense, yes. And you know, I think you know, I think probably we all agree about that. You know that there's there all. You know, I think Charles has made this point more clearly than anybody else. But I don't really dissent from it, except as I try to suggest, it does seem to have this kind of symbolic function, and it does figure prominently in political campaigns. And Trump made a big deal out of it. Uh, you know, your Second Amendment rights will be gone. If I mean, Trump has no understanding of anything. I mean, it's you know, if Trump has ever read the Constitution, it seems like a doubtful proposition. That he could have understood it is beyond, you know, lies beyond the human imagination. So the idea that the election of a president would provoke a Second Amendment that you'd actually need three quarters of the states to agree to, is like so much of the garbage he propounds. You know, complete complete nonsense. Yeah. But it does. But it does function. So you know, I, I just kind of come back and I say this maybe most directly to Charles, but it does seem to be to, to function symbolically, and to be pretty deeply entrenched in our political discourse. And now way, it is. And, and, and in a way, maybe that kind of preempts the more you know focused, sensible discussions that seems to me would improve. I mean, it's, there's no there's no perfect world we're going to create, but it does seem to me we, we can't be anarchists and say that you know the no regulations will be, you know, if we're licensed to drive, why can't we be licensed to you know carry firearms? If you have to go in every four years to kind of take a test or whatever, or every 10 years to prove you know how to parallel park, you know, a declining skill in our overall society, I mean, why not have something similar in the realm of firearms too? We do. I agree. We do in California. But well, that you and I are lucky enough to live here. <laughs> no, but everyone has guns because the gun show, you don't have to. I don't, I don't know what you mean by everyone, Roxanne. I don't, you know. I can think of one or two of my colleagues who I think may shoot. Well, not at Stanford, probably. <laughs> well, you just said you just said everyone, you know. <laughs> no, I mean like, anyone can get a gun. So there are we are a washing guns in in. Yeah, but okay, but look, but there are all these asymmetries, and you know who owns? Yeah, I mean somebody cited this earlier. You know, a few people own a ton of guns, and most many people own none. Yeah. But you see, know, guns I, since the middle 1970s have become a demagogic device for political advancement in a way that was not so prior to the, the right, right. middle 19th. Trump uses, for instance, and a lot of other politicians uses fear, right. black and brown people, right. overwhelming right. white people as the ways and means of uh, whipping up fury around the second amendment. You know, they're going to be coming and they're going to be taking over all of this. So you can see that that really was not so. I think I'm right on this, but that was not so when I was growing up. I mean, guns were routine. Yeah, you could, you as a kid, 
you could join a gun club yeah, yeah, yeah. and they taught you marksmanship and they taught you gun safety and they taught you all this other it was divorced really from the political rhetoric that began to change around as i, I think i said in my remarks with the with the wing uh with the uh takeover of the National Rifle Association right, 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 uh, right. Uh, in the middle of 19th day, you get a different kind of rhetoric around guns and it's attached to the political rhetoric about this country being too liberal, this country breaking, breaking apart on, you know, uh, walking away from the traditions. There's lots of rhetoric, uh, especially if you live in the South, you, you hear yeah. all of the, literally all of the time it's just a part uh, and people buy into that uh, you know i learned as a reporter as a foreign affairs reporter never underestimate the effectiveness of demagoguery i've been in the middle of coup d'etats i never underestimate it. and a lot of that is going on in some ways in unprecedented ways over the last five or six five or six years when you have a president who can encourage an insurrection uh, and I don't know what the meaning, what that's going to mean uh, for the future, but clearly uh, it, we have a core leadership uh, that is really fanning the worst attitudes. Uh, uh, and I know how fast things can change. That's a whole nother discussion that I <laughs> don't think we need to bring into this particular discussion. You know, you know it's, it's important to understand that the takeover of the NRA in 1977 was, was by Harlan Carter. And Harlan Carter was a border guard uh, who then when he retired uh, became, uh, he formed an organization up in Eastern Washington state where white nationalists were beginning together and Western uh, Idaho, and formed the Second Amendment Foundation. That's when the Second Amendment became a thing, and they took over the NRA as the vehicle, and it became a white nationalist organization. It's tied up also with the vets, the POW thing, and coming back from Vietnam, and also a uh, backlash to the uh, freedom movements and the liberation movements of the 1960s and 70s. So it is, I think you're right, Charles, it, there is a demarcation, even though the US has always had more guns, the, um, the fetishism of guns is really, I, I think, quite recent. Yeah, but people forget how young the United States is. Right. You know, and it's still fundamentally, in many ways, a frontier society. It, it doesn't have great age, and so and so yeah, people yeah. run the country. Well, but yeah, I mean, actually, yes and no. I mean, as nation states go, <laughs> we're relatively <laughs> yeah, having a relatively old one at this point. There are, there are a lot of nation states a lot, you know, a lot younger than we are. May I ask a, a question and then turn it over to you all for about two minutes of uh, closing remarks? And I'll just put out a final question uh, that you can choose to address or not. Um, the one thing I've noted in the news media in 2020 and 2021 is a lot of stories about rising rates of gun ownership among Black Americans and among women in uh, the last couple of years. And there seems to be a political debate about uh, whether that's in response to uh, African-American fears of uh, white race, racial violence or whether that's uh, fear of uh, rising crime rates uh, in the midst of and following the pandemic. And so I'd, uh, I, I wonder if you might address uh, that phenomenon of increasing rates of uh, gun ownership among African-Americans and women of late uh, and or uh, offer some of your uh, final thoughts in just about two minutes uh, as we wrap up and close because we're running short on time. But maybe we can uh, go back through um, the order and go with Roxanne, uh, Jack, and then Charles in, in closing. 
Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, the, um, I think what we've left out is the capitalism part. Um, the gun industry, the first corporation ever formed in the United States was the Springfield Arms, uh, set up by, commissioned by Alexander Hamilton uh, during the Seven Year War of Independence before the United States even existed. But the gun industry, in, in, it was in Springfield, Massachusetts, the gun industry is the largest in the world gun exports. So from the very beginning, uh, guns were a commodity. And all of these companies from Springfield, but then Winchester and all of them, and advertisement, especially beginning in um, the early 20th century, when advertisement became, you know, and uh, became a in newspapers and all and billboards and everything. And then, of course, it goes to um, um, to other media that guns are promoted, um, like that thing of training, you know. And the NRA, um, when it changed, uh, became also a. Uh, they set up um, JROTC, the NRA, actually in Parkland, where that took place. Practically all of those survivors and the ones who were killed and including the killer were in JROTC, were in the school auditorium, they get trained in using firearms and the NRA provides the targets and the guns. So uh, the, the proliferation of guns is, um, uh, is, is unique in the world. And, this has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. This has to do with the violence of U.S. Uh, history that continues um, today. That's that's that is unique. So I think we overestimate the um, the power of the Second Amendment. Uh, it's used mostly, as I say, by white nationalists as the only thing they have left. You know, are their guns, as they say. And they take them to January 6th, you know, and to various uh, um, state capitals all during the pandemic, including Sacramento. <laughs> Thank you, Roxanne. Uh, Jack? Yeah, uh, Josh, I don't, I don't have a specific, I don't have an answer to a specific question. I mean, just, but, but maybe to pick up on something Charles is saying, I mean, one thing I've been thinking about a lot is we should be grateful so far that all the political turmoil we've been in, especially even just since January 6th, uh, has not led to, has not yet led to any kind of serious, you know, exchange of, you know, you know release of use of firearms. I, I think, for example, I wonder what would have happened if the Secret Service, assuming you could rely on them, had been in a position where they would have had to open up had Pence really been in danger. You know, instead of having five people dying on January 6th, I mean, suppose it actually had a open up with automatic weapons, you have to 20, 25, 30 people might be killed while the electoral, you know, while you're certifying the elector. So I, you know, I worry a lot about, you know, the increasing potential for political violence with the ready access to firearms when there's been different clips going on the last couple of weeks. I mean, somebody asking Charlie Kirk, you know, when do we get to use our, when do we get to use our weapons? You know, I mean, I don't, I don't know how many steps we are away from actual political violence of the kind we associate with, you know, kind of Weimar Germany or whatever. If we ever get to that point, I mean, the downhill spiral that could, that could take place, given how heavily armed society is, is, you know, is truly disconcerting. But it's, I mean, that's a, that's a couple of removes away from the issue that's concerned us. In one sense, the other hand, it seems to, you know, it actually follows pretty neatly from, you know, some of the points we've been discussing. Very scary. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, Charles? Yeah, I'm sort of in the same place. I'm not, I worry uh, about the rising level of political violence and, it's, and the use of political violence to accomplish political goals, which was part of the January 6th event that unfolded. But I don't have, at this point, any Reach, I have not reached any conclusion 
about beyond worry about what the implications of that are. So now, and it's not anyway a, a part of our discussion um, today. To directly uh, respond to your question, yes, there has been over the last 20 years a growth of black gun clubs. Uh, you know, which is a step, you know, there have always been sort of informal gun clubs in the South, particularly in the rural South. And I got lots of stories about that, but there has been a growth of uh, of formal gun clubs. And that grows out of two fears. Uh, One is uh, fear that they won't be prepared if white people decide to attack them. And particularly in urban areas, fear of the kind of violence that seems endemic to the poorest communities, black and brown communities in urban areas. A typical person that's used his gun, say in Jacksonville, where I live, has used it against intruders who are more often than not black in black communities that's that's so there is that fear too that has to be acknowledged and people are increasingly inclined to organize from it. I have no idea what the impact of, of COVID-19 has been on this on this kind of gathering but yes there has been an increase and there are a handful of clubs that have formed for express political purposes to, you know, black, I'm talking about it, black. Uh, can, there's the new Black Panthers, for instance, which is not related to the old Black Panthers. <laughs> yeah, but they, I, they have guns and they're, they're grouped like that too. But uh, I have no count. As, as, as to how many, I can say it's noticeable because of my book, I hear from them from time to time, you know, asking if I'd be interested in, in meeting with them, come up and, and talk to them and talk about the book since it's about guns. Uh, so it, it's brought it to my, my attention. Well, thank you very much, Charles and Jack and Roxanne, and uh, uh, I'll thank her uh, more psychically uh, to Joyce uh, for joining us via video. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity for us to uh, hear differing viewpoints uh, in a forum such as this, uh, side by side, and hear from such an accomplished set of panelists. So. I want to thank you uh, all so much, and uh, also um, perhaps in closing, uh, turn it over very quickly to Ed to remind our audience to please join us for our next such event. Uh, Ed, do you just want to say very quickly? Yes, thank you, Josh. Our next event will be taking place on Tuesday of next week at 1 o'clock p.m. Central Time. It's on the topic of Congress and the separation of powers. And our panelists will include the political scientists, Julia Azari, Ira Katznelson, and Gary Lawson. So we hope you can join us. And I've placed the link in the chat for that. Yeah, hopefully you can come. I, I see Jack Rakoff uh, chomping at the bits for that. <laughs> yeah, it's another subject I could talk about, but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all again. Uh, thank you. Wishes to everyone, good night.